I'm Sean Collin. Indeed. Oh, thank you. Um, the Retina Fellow who cares more about the optic nerve than you might think. Um, I'm going to be talking about optic neuropathy and high volume intravitreal injections, hopefully with a focus on uh, glaucomatous optic neuropathies. And just got to figure out. Harder than it seems to go to the next slide. Um, so I just want to review some of the injections that uh, we're specifically talking about when we talk about high volume intravitreal injections right now. We've got two new drugs for dry macular degeneration that we're using increasingly uh, frequently here at the Marin Eye Center and in the community. Those two drugs are Cyfovri uh, and Isorve. Cyfovri is a complement factor three inhibitor. It's given on a Q2 month injection schedule. And these drugs uh, are not given on an as needed basis or on a treat and extend basis like uh, our anti-VEGF drugs are, but they're given Q2 months for uh, presumably for life. Um, Cyfovri in its phase three trials demonstrated 16 to 18% reduction in geographic atrophy growth over two years. Uh, the other drug is Isorve. It's complement factor five inhibitor given on a monthly schedule demonstrated a 14% reduction in geographic atrophy growth over its first year in its phase three trial. Uh, year two data is forthcoming. Both of these are 0.1 milliliter injection volume, which is double what we've historically been giving with our anti-VEGF injections, which is 0.05 milliliters. We also have ILEA-HD, which is a newer anti-VEGF, really just a higher dose of uh, an older anti-VEGF that we give at a 0.07 milliliter volume. As a reminder for who we're using these for and why we're using them, uh, in the trials, these drugs were given to patients with geographic atrophy lesions greater than 2.5 millimeters squared or multifocal geographic atrophy lesions greater than 1.25 millimeters squared. This photo is for reference. 2.5 millimeters squared is roughly the size of an optic nerve head in, a, in an average patient. Now, in these trials, although we know that the, the drugs inhibit geographic atrophy growth, there was limited proof of functional benefit. Uh, the phase three trials failed to show any benefit to acuity, reading speed, microperimetry, uh, visual, uh, visual functioning questionnaires. There is, however, emerging data about functional benefit. Uh, recently published pooled post hoc analysis of the phase two and three data from iSurve did show uh, an improved survival curve for uh, meeting the threshold for legal driving vision, which is certainly uh, a meaningful metric, and, and hopefully we'll see more proof of functional benefit as we get longer term data. Uh, in practice, what I see here typically is that we're giving these drugs to patients with fovea threatening GA in the better eye. So one eye already affected visual acuity reduced from subfovial geographic atrophy, the other eye uh, at risk of losing central vision. So the question that I wanna discuss today is, do higher volume intravitreal injections carry an increased risk of optic nerve related adverse events? Uh, for example, glaucoma progression, retinal nerve fiber layer thinning, visual field loss, sustained interactive pressure increase or ischemic optic neuropathy. And in full disclosure, there's, there's very limited data for these new drugs. Um, so I'm gonna reference some older drugs from the anti-VEGF uh, drugs that we've been using and then talk about what we do know from the data that we have. So it's intuitive that if we inject any volume of anything into an eye, we're going to uh, see a, an immediate rise in intraocular pressure. But for some time now, there's been some evidence to suggest that some of these patients receiving intravitreal injections have sustained elevations of intraocular pressure. A 2016 meta-analysis found a two-fold increase in the risk of sustained intraocular pressure elevation with anti-VEGF. And in 2019, the AEO published a report um, uh, it, sort of to address this question, unsurprisingly, uh, showing that there is an immediate and transient elevation of intraocular pressure in all patients receiving injections, but also that in uh, many of the studies they looked at, they did find uh, that 4 to 15% of patients experienced a sustained elevation of intraocular pressure. There's also... Awesome. That's a great question. There are numerous criteria that I'll get into in one second, um, but different papers use different criteria for what that means. I'll give an example of one in, in one second. Also looking at some older data, uh, something that's always been interesting to me, Protocol S is one of the DRCR network studies. Um, 
interesting in that it was a large study and had uh, data through five years. They also collected data on retinal nerve fiber layer and on uh, visual field. The randomizumab group in this trial had greater RNFL thinning than PRP at two years. Now, there are tons of explanations for this, uh, many of which have nothing to do with uh, pressure spikes, although the authors did note that transient uh, pressure spikes could be a, a cause of this or contributing to it. Uh, they also, after two years, had progressive visual field loss, and that was in patients who did not receive any rescue PRP. Again, many explanations for this, among them that we know that patients with PDR have peripheral non-perfusion that can affect their peripheral visual fields. Um, but just interesting data to add to the to the mix. Now, when we get into higher volume intravitreal injections, clinically, we've only been using these with regularity uh, for the most part in recent years, but uh, historically, there have been other drugs that have been tried and used. Um, in 2012, uh, a study investigating a different drug that was given at a 0.1 milliliter volume found that the mean intraocular pressure two minutes after injection was 47.1. Now, this had normalized by 30 minutes on average, uh, but they did see very large spikes in the short term. Lampolizumab was a complement factor D inhibitor that was being tried for treatment of dry macular degeneration. It failed to meet its endpoint in its phase three trials, and so it never gained any traction. But they did publish a post hoc analysis of their data this year that demonstrated a higher incidence of increased pre procedural intraocular pressure uh, over one year. So, this is an example of the criteria that are used for this. So, this is the based on the BACRI criteria. The BACRI criteria are uh, that patients must have a pre-procedural IOP of 21, 25, or 30 with an increase of at least 6, 8, or 10 from their baseline pre-procedural intraocular pressure. So the baseline pre-procedural intraocular pressure is before any injections are given at all, and then they're checked pre-procedurally at each subsequent injection. And if they meet that criteria, then they qualify as having had uh, elevated um, pre-procedural intraocular pressure. So here we can see the dark bars are the uh, lampolizumab group, and the light bars are the sham group. We can see there's a definite trend towards higher pre-procedural, I shouldn't say higher pre-procedural, there's a trend towards patient patients having a greater change from their baseline pre-procedural intraocular pressure in the lampolizumab group. What's interesting is that the effect is also observed in the fellow eye to a lesser extent, uh, but uh, still observed in the fellow eye to some extent. Now, speci specifically talking about Isare and Sifovri, the data we have from their phase two and three trials, we really have limited data on intraocular pressure. In the phase two trial for Isare, IOP was not explicitly reported in any of the publications or supplementary material that I could find. They did report transient injection related events, nothing specifically about intraocular pressure. In the phase three trial, they documented that, quote, IOP increased in 9%. And again, I couldn't actually figure out exactly what that meant looking through the, the paper or the supplementary material. Likewise, in the phase two for Sifovri, IOP increased in 1.2%. And in their phase three, it was not explicitly reported. However, their website says that uh, the IOP increased by 5%. Uh, or five percent of patients experienced IOP increase in both the monthly and every other monthly group. Uh, of note, although we give Cyfovri on a Q2 month injection schedule in the trial, it was tried in a monthly dosing regimen and every other month dosing regimen, and compared with sham injections. Yeah. In what sense? I feel like if I leave an eye with extra fluid in it in the front of the eye, at the end of like the cataract surgery, and I left it at 40, yeah. it really wouldn't come down. It. Yeah. Like, like folks. <laughs> That's a, yeah. So Dr. Zog's asking, um, how does an eye handle an increase in intraocular pressure like that? Talking about how if, if we leave an eye firm at the end of cataract surgery, it's not back to normal pressure by 30 minutes. And yet we have this data, like I was just talking about from 2012, where on average it is normalized after 30 minutes after 0 0.1. Um, so the I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that uh, there is that data from that study. And then also there certainly seems to be uh, plenty of 
movement between the anterior chamber and the uh, vitreous cavity, even in phacic, you know, healthy eyes. For instance, when we're doing, uh, you know, pneumatics and injecting fairly large volumes of gas, like 0.3, the anterior chamber will um, will basically flatten it, and then it it reequilibrates. Uh, I don't know exactly how quickly, but but to me, surprisingly quickly. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a better answer to that question. Go through the trabecular meshwork, it seems like. <laughs> um, but that's actually part of the, you know, proposed uh, mechanisms for um, sustained intraocular pressures is, you know, damage to the trabecular meshwork through these repeated intraocular pressure spikes, um, one of many proposed mechanisms. Um, so another thing that came from the Iserve and the Cephovery trials that was of interest were these episodes of ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, overall, the absolute number of these events was very small, uh, but they did all occur in the monthly injection groups. So in the Cyphovery trials, they had three events over 24 months. That comes to 0.7% of patients within the monthly group, 0% in the every other month in the sham group. Again, though, it's interesting because reviewing their website, they report something different. Uh, which is that ischemic optic neuropathy occurred in 1.7% of patients treated monthly, 0.2% treated every other month, and 0% of sham. In the phase two trial for Iserve, Philly, they reported one event over 18 months. Again, that was in the monthly group. Because the sample size was so small, that came out to 1.5%. Um, in the year one data for the phase three, there were no events of ischemic optic neuropathy. And the two-year data is forthcoming, but based on interviews I've uh, read um, from the examiners, there were no events through year two. So this is just uh, something that we sort of need to keep an eye on as we're getting more long-term data and giving these injections to more patients. So at this point for the new drugs, there's a lot of missing data. We have very limited data on intraocular pressure. We don't know exactly what uh, intraocular pressure increase means when it's documented in the trials. Uh, we don't have much information about the mechanism of sustained intraocular pressure elevation, although there are theories. Uh, to my knowledge, there's been no reporting of RNFL changes or peripheral visual field changes with these new higher volume injections. And then, of course, uh, we're lacking long-term data, which is really where we'd expect to see any significant changes in nerve fiber layer or uh, visual field changes. So in conclusion, we have limited data at this point, both on efficacy and safety, although both of those things are, are changing rapidly. We do have encouraging efficacy data. We know that uh, these drugs do uh, slow the progression of geographic atrophy. Uh, and there's some evidence, again, based on uh, not yet published data that I've uh, been reading about, that this effect may be even greater between years one and two, between years two and three compared to in the, in the first year. There's also definitely emerging data on functional benefit. And again, if you know these drugs allow patients to uh, drive safely longer, that's obviously a very meaningful benefit for people. On the other hand, uh, we have this you know, statement that intraocular pressure increased in five to nine percent of patients, which certainly could be a concern, especially for our patients who already have uh, moderate or severe glaucoma and uh, fovea threatening geographic atrophy. And then we have this uh, question of ischemic optic neuropathy uh, and these handful of events, um, still a, a very low absolute number and definitely impossible to draw any definitive conclusions. But uh, one thing that has been proposed is that these could be related to the transient extreme intraocular pressure elevations. So time will hopefully help to elucidate a lot of these questions. That's all I have for now. Probably inspired more questions than I answered, but happy to take them. Um, geographic atrophy, do you think are more likely to cause IOP spikes compared to anti-VEGF? Or is it that the relative benefit of them is less, and so we should consider the impact on IOP more? Or do we think this is the same for any injection, and these are just kind of following the same suit that the Avastin, the anti-VEGF injections are already doing? So Dr. Simpson is asking, are we concerned that these drugs specifically are more likely to cause glaucomatous damage or 
uh, are we saying that these drugs are maybe less effective and therefore we should be more cautious with them in, in our patients with glaucoma? Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not intending to claim either of those things. Um, I think the reason we're talking about this is because this is, you know, we already know that IOP spikes happen in, in the 0.05 milliliter injections and people have, you know, transient blackouts of vision. Um, and it just intuitively, I think there's, it makes sense that we'll have more of those with these injections. I think people are, you know, a little bit more concerned about what impact, if any, there will be from the higher volume injections. Um, like I said, I think, I think as, as more data emerges, about the functional benefit of these, we may find that uh, actually these these do provide a really meaningful benefit to patients, but it's it's so early on, it's hard to say. I don't think there's anything specific about these drugs as in them being complement inhibitors that points towards uh, damage to the optic nerve. Uh, although with anti-VEGF, there, there is specifically issues with that. VEGF is uh, known to be neuroprotective. And so inhibition of that, one of the theories there is that inhibition of that can cause uh, neurofibrillary loss or damage. Dr. Bernstein. Yeah. So in practice, you know, a number of my patients have these spikes and, you know, <laughs> and they, they either black out or they have pain. And so it's important to identify them. And I try to pre-treat them and I'm trying to encourage the technicians to not, you know, to give them an, a pressure lowering drop, not to do it 30 seconds before I'm about to do the injection. I'm trying to say if they're identified, then they should get the drop pressure lowering drop on arrival, basically. So it has a little bit of time to work. And but it, there definitely are some patients that have to work with the glaucoma service. You get them more aggressively um, pressure managed before they come in. And occasionally they have to have surgery just to keep going on their injections. Yeah, Dr. Bernstein is just commenting that he He's inside the ceiling. Mics are on. Oh, good. Okay, people can hear. Everything. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. But I guess, um, you know, have you had that always work? Like giving, you know, I have a patient who takes Diamox before every injection, but then like three times in a row, she still had like blackouts. You know, should we should we be, you know, doing an AC tap if someone's vision is still totally blacked out after five minutes? You know. Um, yeah, what are the I mean, kind of... I mean, my comment is there's some patients that definitely it makes a difference by giving them at least the pressure allowing drop on arrival. There's some that it doesn't, and then I have to I send them to glaucoma and say, you have to help me figure it out if they really need these injections. I have some patients like I do an AC tap before every injection, but I do worry about the consequence of putting, you know, 60 holes in their cornea, but I haven't had any problems from that yet. How uh, other people have managed by like pressing on the eye with a Q-tip. So I've tried that a couple of times. I don't know if anyone else has experience with that, trying to like, I don't know. I was like, isn't pressing on the eye with a Q-tip basically making their IOP like 80 while you're pressing on it? Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, should anyone have experience with that working or not working? Dr. Zariski. So pressing on it with a Q-tip is kind of an old school remedy for angle closure, you know? Uh, to, I don't, you know, deepen the anterior chamber with just kind of, you know, forcing, the idea is you're kind of forcing fluid out into the periphery and kind of breaking an ankle closure. Uh, again, it's kind of gone by the wayside. However, maybe there is application here with the idea of being, you're, like I said, you're trying to force fluid to the periphery of the anterior chamber and kind of blow back the iris. And, but the, the mechanism, as you've indicated, is a, not all that well understood. And like Paul saying, I mean, we've, we've got several patients that are managing these spikes and, and I've got them that from some, we just do uh, vermonidine before and after and it seems to work and others have had a track, you know, because they just, just can't control what seems to be quite dangerous pressure spiking and then showing some evidence on, you know, testing visual field, OCT and otherwise. Yeah, they are indeed sustain some damage work. I, I, I'm thinking of one lady right now in particular who um, seems to have pretty dramatic spikes and uh, following her very closely, but her visual field and everything just seems to be perfectly stable. So we're just managing her with, you know, pre and post jobs. It's a complicated 
complicated question. Uh, and even going back to the anti vegf days, it's had a really interesting history. You know, too too much to talk about it now, but you know, the evolution of pressure control with these injections has been fascinating. It's been fascinating to watch, and uh, lot still a lot of unknown questions. Sean, you may have seen this uh, in some international settings where they're still doing retrofill blood blocks for all the surgeries. But they'll still place weights on the eye uh, too. And, and again, that both retrofill blood block, and there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one of one of them that was explained to me is, is you can get eye open spikes after that. And actually putting pressure on helps distend the tissues and force pull it out. That was entirely anecdotal from the individual. But um, yeah, uh, theoretically, you could, on some level, create some additional capacity just by stretching out the tissue. All right. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, our next presenter uh, is uh, Elizabeth or Libby Fairless. She's our medical retina fellow. Um, and she did uh, medical school at Yale and she did residency at the University of Oklahoma. And she's going to talk about retinal detachment after clear lens extraction. the risk factors. It's playing. Um, wanted to talk about things that happen with me in the past. I don't know to how patients and surgeons understand the surgical risks and talk about the surgical risks. And I also wanted to talk about some preoperative strategies to minimize. So, clear lens uh, exchange, as we know, is removal of the crystalline lens prior to cataract formation for the purpose of you know, refractive error or presiopia. And so, just by its nature, it's something that's uh, an elective procedure or something that's going to be occurring more in younger people. Um, increasing in popularity um, as one of the many options for refractive surgery we can offer our patients. And I wanted to talk about, um, I was kind of started to talk about this subject because of a patient I saw relatively recently who was a younger guy who had clear lens exchange done in an outside practice and then developed a retinal detachment. And in talking to him, I felt like uh, you know, he didn't really understand you know, the risk of the surgery he had undergone, which is certainly not unique to most patients. And I don't hear some of the but um, I think it's important to understand that he can do a surgery uh, in retinal attachment after the surgery because it's something that may be occurring uh, years after the surgery. Surgeons you know, may not kind of draw the connection between their surgery they perform with this patient. And if you're someone who's co-managing, um, maybe you're not seeing a patient after you know, year mark after cataract surgery. So you're not maybe seeing this complication that has occurred. And I think it's, you know, possible that surgeons may underestimate the probability of risk with this particular. Um, so I'm going to talk about something about optimism, optimism bias. Um, it's something that plays into the fact that, you know, humans are really kind of bad at estimating risk for ourselves um, in particular. Optimism bias is our tendency to overestimate the likelihood of positive events and underestimate the likelihood of negative events. And you can see that across, you know, a range of, of different scenarios. People think they, they are less likely to get divorced or die from smoking. They think they're more likely to get success from an experimental drug and trials uh, or live longer than average. And, Obviously, not everyone can be uh, above that. So, that um, so is with this bias as well. You know, I saw a number of different studies uh, that illustrated this that we overestimate how adherent uh, patients are to medications we prescribe. We overestimate how likely um, a patient is to get pain relief from a procedure. Simultaneously, we also might underestimate how uh, painful a procedure is to undergo. I didn't find any, you know, Specific studies looking at, uh, you know, ophthalmology and surgeons talk about the risk, but I think it's not a stretch to think that we're not immune from the same kind of biases when we talk to patients. And then when you get into clear lens extraction as being a an elective procedure and something that has, you know, financial incentives, um, you know, whether we want to believe that estimate, you know, affects how we talk to patients or not, I think again, it's not something we're immune to. Um, 
I want to show these images as just a kind of illustration about some of the information patients might be getting about clear lens extraction. Um, I took these uh, screenshots from the website of a high volume uh, refractive surgery practice in Oklahoma City where I did my residency. It's a practice uh, us residents became very familiar with because we were often seeing the surgeon's complications. And I thought it was interesting how, um, how this was being advertised. So you could see that they're you know, targeting people that are over 40 years old for this surgery, so quite young. They're marketing this surgery as something that's not just elective, but something that has like a, um, like a treating a, a disease almost. They say you know, that the lens is dysfunctional and that you're preventing a future cataract, which I think is a very you know, optimistic way to spin an, an elective procedure. Uh, when we look at their FAT about what are the risks of retinal uh, of clear lens extraction, you know they don't risk they don't specifically mention any risks including retinal detachment. They just say, oh yeah, there's there's risk, but it's you know very uncommon. So that's some of the information patients might be coming in with about uh, about this surgery. So um, what are the risk factors? Um, these are things that probably all uh, make a lot of sense to us. You know, if you have a Poster capsule rupture and intraoptic vitreal slots, that's a, a huge risk factor for developing a pseudofacial retinal detachment. If you have a long myopic eye, uh, male gender is also a risk factor that comes up in a number of studies. It's not you know, consistent across all the studies I found. Some studies, you know, when you controlled for other risk factors, that gender predisposition went away. If you have a predisposing retinal lesion like lattice degeneration, that will put you at risk. And in young age and a lack of a PVD, you know, go hand in hand. Um, the younger you are, the less likely it is that you have a PVD. And we know that a large portion of retinal detachments occur in the setting of developing a PVD, and that cataract surgery often triggers a PVD in patients. So that's um, part of the mechanism about why you know PVD is so important. Retinal detachment. Yes. So Libby had a question about that one. Yeah. So how do you identify or diagnose a PVD? Uh, by clinical exam, looking at their fundus, um, looking for a wide string or the posterior hyaline face. And as you can see that it's elevated and you can also use uh, OCT as well to help you if it's difficult to see if they have a very clear uh, vitreous. So one of the interesting things is like looking at macular OCT images to yeah. To help in that diagnosis when you can't clinically see a PVD yeah. or Weiss ring. Um, and sometimes you'll see where there's like a millimeter separation of the vitreous face off of the macula. You're not, we're not usually like imaging the optic nerve right. to look for a PVD, but usually the macula. Right. And so I think that it's like a good question of like how how are these diagnosed that they had a PVD before their clear lens versus not? So yeah, um, so, yeah, you can also you know, shift the OCT to include the optic nerve so you can be certain that it's not just an incomplete. Yeah. yeah, so definitely you know for the medical students and residents, like we're talking about a complete PVD. You know, on uh, everyone that's young, they have a partial PVD where you can see the vitreous separated from the retina on OCT. Uh, but my study actually uh, demonstrated that when you can see that partial PVD, we know that that's accurate. But when you see no vitreous on the OCT, their vitreous could be either attached or detached. So uh, the uh, predictive value of seeing, you know, if you see nothing, you cannot say they have a complete PVD. If you see something, you know that they don't have a complete PVD. So do my retina partners have a recommendation when I'm counseling these clear lens patients on? when I can say that, yes, your risk is lower versus not based on imaging or me seeing the white screen or not, since you're gonna deal with my clear lens. Uh, I, would say, <laughs> I would say, you know, if you see a PVD on slip lamp exam, I think it's not just necessarily seeing a white ring. Like if you get a really bright light, like from a, you know, 20 or 30 degree angle and you can see that posterior vitreous face, I can send, you know, videos to you guys uh, I would I would trust you to say that there is a PVD and that they are safe to go ahead with very low risk of retinal detachment. Okay. Um, so I wanted to look into some of the data that, um, about um, retinal detachment after the extraction um, and focus on a few different um, main risk factors. The first one being age. Um, there's a very strong inverse correlation between age and risk of near retinal detachment. Um, 
previous new studies gave us some um, good data uh, in the first study, which was coming out of New Zealand, that looked at patients that were over age 40 that um, underwent um, uh, cataract extraction and they looked at the over you know, the course of 10 years of how these patients did. And okay. they found that, you know, for this cohort, the overall rate of retinal detachment is only about one point um, one seven percent, but in people that were younger than fifty years old, that rate um, jumped quite dramatically, in my mind at least, to five percent of patients uh, developing a retinal detachment. Um, whereas if you were over seventy, then that rate was only about 065 percent. As I kind of mentioned earlier, this can be a delayed uh, complication. The median time in this study was thirty nine months. Um, in the second study, um, which um, is Danish study, I believe. Um, it, they looked specifically at young patients who were under 61 years old that were go undergoing either cataract extraction or clear lens exchange. And they found similarly that um, in people that were between like 50, 54 years old, also around 5% risk of retinal detachment. And um, that's, uh, again, most retinal detachments with occurred within the first couple of years after surgery. In this uh, third study, it was a large cohort of patients, 18,000 patients, again, that were followed for several years. And um, they found, again, similarly, people who are under 60 years old, the hazard ratio developing retinal detachment 5.12 compared to if you were over 80, very low, 0.16%. Uh, and um, they controlled for axial length then male, uh, male gender and vitreous loss, which were all also risk factors for um, retinal detachment, uh, you know, vitreous loss, as you might imagine, has a very high hazard ratio, 12.83. Um, I wanted to expand on the second study a little bit more to talk about how um, myopia and axial length plays in as a risk factor. Um, so expanding on that second study from the previous slide, um, Axial length is a really significant risk factor for retinal detachment in these patients. The hazard ratio was 1.42 for every millimeter increase in uh, axial length. In this study, people who were between 25 and 28, uh, 25 or above axial length had a 10% of those patients developed retinal detachment. It was obviously quite, quite high. And the majority of retinal detachments in that study, which again were people who were young, uh, was in people with a, a longer axial length. Um, another, a little bit older study, a little bit smaller study, uh, looked at patients who were specifically undergoing clear lens extraction for high myopia greater than 12 diopters, which, gosh, I really hope no one is selecting those patients for <laughs> this kind of surgery. Um, they, if they had predisposing retinal uh, lesions, they did get prophylactic laser prior to the surgery, but still there was, you know, four 49 eyes, so about 8% of patients developed a retinal attachment. One was bilateral. And in this study, again, patients were quite young. So um, a question that arose in my mind as I was reviewing some of this data is, you know, how much risk is really attributable to the surgery, to other risk factors? And I think these two studies kind of um, have good control groups that help us parse out what is really the, what really is the risk coming from the surgery itself. This first study is a very large study, over 200,000 patients who underwent cataract extraction or clear lens exchange only in one eye, and their fellow eye served as their control. And they found that, in, yeah, being pseudofake was an independent risk factor for retinal detachment with a um, relative risk of 4.23, and that this risk is, you know, persists for up to 10 years after surgery. Uh, similarly, similarly, in the second study here, which comes from the Rochester Epidemiologic Project, um, also looking at quite a large um, number of patients, 10,000 eyes who underwent cataract extraction and uh, had age-matched controls, uh, patients that were matched by age, gender, and their follow-up interval as their control arm. And similar, also in a similar um, result, they found the probability ratio was four times higher after cataract surgery. Similarly, age as a high risk factor and uh, this effect persists for many years after surgery. You know, the unfortunate thing is none of these studies controlled for axial length, um, but you know, presumably these large cohort of patients in, you know, included a, a people with a variety of refractive error. 
So how can we, um, you know, guide our patients preoperatively and make sure we are minimizing risk as much as possible? One, you know, doing a very thorough retinal exam to see if they have a predisposing lesion, looking for a DVD, thinking about their axial length and how much that plays into um, the risk of the surgery. I think in many patients, we should be thinking about an alternative procedure like a fake IOL. Um, you know, I think if someone's a young, high myope, they probably really shouldn't be undergoing this procedure. I think the risk, at least in my mind, is not acceptable on these uh, patients. Um, if they are going to undergo surgery, making sure that you really thoroughly counsel them um, about the risks. And then um, I did find that there is this retinal detachment risk calculator that's been, de been developed. It comes from a surgeon from the Netherlands, Dr. Frank Kerhoff, who is an anterior segment surgeon and also a retinal surgeon. Uh, so dealing with his own complications, I guess, sometimes. And he developed this uh, calculator it, it's using literary data in conjunction with the epidemiologist, um, epidemiologist and I couldn't find the exact citations he used in developing this calculator and one, one article about it. I did find some of the citations, but just to say that, you know, I don't fully know how this calculator was developed, but you can input the patient's age, their refractive error, whether they have lattice or a PVD, their gender and axial length and get a score. So I did this for myself out of curiosity as if I was going to undergo clear lens extraction at age 45. I'm a high myope, uh, thankfully no lattice or PVD. And in my basic risk, it said was 0 0.07% uh, yeah. yearly. And after uh, clear lens extraction, that would jump to 1.82%, so over 20-fold increase in risk. Uh, so not as per surgery I'm going to be undergoing, but um, maybe this will be useful in, in thinking about risk for patients. And I'm definitely curious to hear from the surgeons in the room about what criteria they use and, and who they offer this surgery to. Thank you. So I, this is something I deal with like every day of like battling these decisions, but we have kind of a gap in um, our off, kind of our offerings to patients right now. Um, ICLs are approved up to the age of 45. And I kind of run in the back of my mind that 50 is kind of my minimum age for clear lens based on some of these studies that you presented. I don't know if it should be 55 based on some of the studies you presented now, um, but you kind of have this gap of 45 to 50 where people are really struggling with their vision. And so there is definitely a downward trend of the age that people are offering clear lens. Mm. For me, the hyperopes are a lot better options at that age range because I, I feel like their RD risk is lower, but maybe I, that's not substantiated. I think but, that is borne out by some of the studies. Some one study I looked at, you know, none of the hyperopes had a retinal attachment. So I think that's yeah. reasonable thought. But then you have these high myopes that are coming in at 45 to 50, uh, where an ICL is not FD approved. And so you're like, we can go off FD approval and use these lenses, or, or you can wait till you're 50. And that kind of the conversation that I have with them. And then you're kind of weighing the risk. What is the real risk of an ICL uh, with retinal attachment risk versus a clear lens? I agree with you. I do think the risk is elevated in a clear lens versus an ICL, probably at any age. Um, but that risk isn't zero either in somebody who's coming in at minus 12 to minus 16 or 18. So yeah. I don't know. You have patients who are definitely like scratching and clawing for like whatever they can get in some of these ranges. And there are definitely surgeons. There are surgeons who are doing clear lens at 30 year olds pretty regularly wow. um, throughout the, even the U S. And so it's, it's definitely a startling trend that's occurring because of the, they feel like the lens technology has gotten to the point where it's so good that they're offering a better visual life for these people, which I completely disagree with. But so I, I think it's a really important thing to keep studying for sure. Yeah, that's something I saw. And like the, a lot of, you know, again, and how this is advertised, it's like, oh, the lens technology is great. It's, well, yeah, the lens is maybe good, but that's not, yeah, that's not why we're worried about that. Yeah, just to underscore that, I've heard some surgeons state that, you know, LASIK will become obsolete in the near future because one technology is, is so good. You know, the bottom line is, you know, Brian knows the trend. The trend is as lens technology improves, um, this is going to be offered more and more. And, and you know, as we've seen, 
you know, similar to the practice that, that you referenced, you know, Oklahoma, that there will always be uh, individuals putting this out. And the challenge is where the only available information is often from those putting this out, advertising. And so for our patients, uh, this becomes very much their, their baseline information. They're searching and exploring options for them for surgery. I'm getting questions about it right now, uh, even though I'm not a LASIK surgeon. Um, so I'm a little bit similar to Brian, but I do have like a 55, like minimum age for colonics extraction from myopes. And you're right, there is that 45 to 55 year kind of gap for someone who's high myope. And, and I tell them about the retinal detachment risk. And I also, I do spin it like what Jeff was saying about lens technology getting better. I kind of spin it like if I have a 52 year old who's a high myope, I'm saying, you know, we should we should wait a few years, but the good news is lens technology keeps getting better. So in three years, we'll have something, you know, potentially better to offer than what we've got right now. Um, so that I think makes patients feel a little bit better about waiting. Like they want to get out of their glasses and contact lenses, but if there's better technology, they're willing to wait. Yeah, I think another thing to consider is that fortunately, like in myopia, PVD occurs at a younger age. So you could, you know, consider like even if someone was younger than 50 and you could tell for sure they had a complete PVD, you could consider the surgery. But once they get really high myopic, it's very hard to tell if they have a PVD or not because their vitreous is so like transparent. It goes back to my other question. I mean, I need something that I can say yes or no. <laughs> Sorry. I think there's a, there's some question in the online chat. Oh, it's not on the chat, but uh, someone is unmuted. Marissa? Hi. Yes. Um, I don't know if there's pediatric ophthalmologists in the crowd as well, but how does this pertain to, you know, adolescents or children and cataract surgery and the risk of retinal detachment? I mean, I do think a lot, a, a lot about it in terms of clear lens exchange, people in their 50s. Um, but does it mean it's even higher in kids that we're doing cataract surgery on or like a 15 year old with with a uveitic cataract, but maybe their vision's like 20, 30, they could still drive. Like at what point is that risk benefit ratio in favor of doing surgery? And normally I'm thinking of this in terms of, of you know, of taking away accommodation, but maybe we should be thinking of it more in terms of risk of retinal detachment in, in these very young patients. And I, I don't think we talk a lot about this. Um, in some of the studies I looked at, there wasn't a big enough sample size in these very young patients to draw a lot of conclusions about that. Um, you know, in one study, it, it seemed like there was actually sort of like a peak of um, incidence of retinal detachment in people around their 50s, and it was slightly lower in people who were in their 40s or 30s. But again, it was a smaller sample size, which is why I didn't get into that data so much. So there and I don't know, fully know the answer to that question, but I don't think it's ne necessarily like an exponential increase, um, or at least we can't can't assume that it's just an exponential increase the younger you are. Well, there are two issues. One is the issue of the congenital cataract kid doing surgery early. They don't really have a higher retinal detachment risk. Their morbidity is basically associated with dense amblyopia due to a myriad of factors uh, the issue of the myos. I mean, we have had clear or done clear lens extractions in kids. And typically where this becomes an issue is the developmentally impaired child who is very myopic, who will not wear glasses, will not wear contact lenses. I know Larry Tyson in, in St. Louis has done a bunch of, uh, of refractive procedures, you know, LASIK and other procedures on that population simply to make them functional. Because otherwise having them function as an uncorrected 20 after mile is, uh, you know, it just doesn't work. And so changing lives, but I think that if you're gonna do that in a child, you need to make them aware that there is a risk. You know, we talk about doing that in a youngster. We talk about the risks associated with the surgery and that you can mitigate most of those risks by not doing surgery at all but then you're left with a child who is horribly out of focus. And so for those kids, the issue, the accommodation issue is really, we can deal with that. And what we try to do with the developmentally impaired kids is leave them a little myopic 
So their best focus may be in here. That may be where they want to function, but we want them to see across the room. And most of them are not going to be drivers. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, everyone, for the good discussion. And thank you, Olivia, for your presentation. Uh, he's our uh, senior uh, surgical retina fellow. He um, also went to medical school at Yale and did his residency at OHSU. I will let him finish. How do you pronounce your last? Hoffman. 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 Hoffman.
So the clinical evaluation historically was based on just looking and an exam and looking essentially at these sort of grading criteria with how thick and dense the fibrosis um, appears on exam with progressive degrees of uh, wrinkling and distortion of the retinal contour and retinal vessels. Um, but what's of course been really helpful is um, um, is development and understanding of how certain things change with development of epiretinal membranes on OCT. And so we'll divide that up into inner and outer retina. And so for the inner retina, so these more superficial layers, um, there's a sort of a staging system or criteria that was developed um, back in 2017 that looked at these progressive development of what are called um, ectopic interfovial layers that um, come about with progressive um, contraction and um, uh, growth of epiretinal membrane. And so this just kind of walks through those stages. So in stage one, um, there's an epiretinal membrane present, but there's still a preserved foveal contour. And then in stage two, the next step is that the foveal contour gets disrupted and you get this absence of the normal foveal pit. And then really this, what's thought to be a, a more critical juncture is then at stage three, when you develop these ectopic interfovia layers, whereby the normal structure of the fovea, which just should have photoreceptors only, now develops these inner retinal layers that sort of are developed or grow over or sort of brought over um, the central fovea where they no shouldn't normally be. And then stage four is progressive disorganization and loss of the sort of normal demarcations of these layers. So stage one, old, uh, stage one membranes, of course, are are um, generally not visually significant. Um, the visual acuity is quite good. And then with progression of these stages, um, the visual acuity uh, is worse. This is just an example of a patient who had over a three-year period um, this progressive development of an epiretinal membrane with eventual development of these ectopic interfovea layers. And so the study looking at these staging at these stages really found that this sort of junction between patients going from stage two to stage three is really where um, a lot of visual acuity um, decrement can occur. And so um, the progressive staging and development of these ectopic layers um, has been uh, significantly associated, um, negatively associated with visual acuity. Um, both before as well as visual, uh, the ability to improve vision after having epiretinal membrane surgery, as well as being associated with worse metamorphopsia. And so again, it's thought that potentially at this sort of junction or this stage when you're sort of in between the stage two and three range, when there's certainly visual symptoms is when um, you might be able or it might be an optimal time to intervene. The other thing, of course, important to look at is the outer retina. And so typically I'd say that the most common thing that we look at is essentially the, the preservation of the photoreceptor outer segments, which is characterized by that ellipsoid zone, which normally should be a nice sort of bright continuous band. And so in some instances with progressive disorganization of the photoreceptors with ERMs, you can get loss or discontinuity of the ellipsoid zone, particularly even independent of having um, cystoid macular edema. And similarly, patients that have been found to have ellipsoid zone discontinuity have been shown to have worse preoperative as well as the potential for postoperative visual acuity compared to patients who have preserved outer retinal structure and ellipsoid zone integrity. So the timing of epiretinal membrane surgery is really sort of a multifactorial sort of decision based on these features. So most important really is the patient's symptoms and concerns and how much these symptoms like metamorphopsia anisoconia are affecting um, uh, their function in ADLs. Visual acuity, historically, the thought is that, generally speaking, that the risk of surgery, you know, is warranted when patients get to sort of a point of 20-40 vision or worse. Um, but that, of course, you know, if someone has really debilitating metamorphopsia um, that with better acuity, that that might be a reason still to, to be able to get do surgery. And then using these sort of prognostic OCT markers um, to help gauge in someone who has potentially concomitant pathology, whether the epiretinal membrane might be actually contributing and how much it accounts for the vis patient's visual symptoms and, and um, visual acuity. Prognosis of ERMs is generally quite good. So most patients do not need epiretinal membrane surgery. About half of eyes that come in with a presenting visual acuity will maintain that same level of vision or within one line at about three year follow-up. 
and only about 20% of eyes, at least in one study, who are better than 2040 will require surgery within the four to seven year time period um, of follow-up. Of the people who do need surgery or who do get surgery, most people will then get benefits. So about 60 to 85% of patients will experience two lines of visual acuity improvement. The biggest predictor of visual acuity um, postoperatively being preoperative visual acuity. Most patients will have improvement in these other symptoms like metamorphopsia, although anisoconia tends to be more resistant to improvement with surgery. And then really the key that we tell patients is that the symptoms can take quite a long time, you know, six up to 12 months even for the retinal architecture to sort of normalize and for the visual symptoms to sort of fully improve to the degree that they will. And so that kind of brings in, I think, the you know um, next last piece that I want to talk about, which is sort of the co-occurrence of cataract. And so in general, with ERM surgery and vitrectomy in general, cataract is one of the most common complications. Up to 80% of patients will require cataract surgery uh, within two years after vitrectomy, and it's especially common in older patients, so those over 50 years old. So one of the things that sort of comes up, you know, thinking about, you know, how long it takes in general for epiretinal membranes to improve symptomatically with surgery and how common it is to develop cataract is the idea of whether it's beneficial and um, uh, uh, or in what sequence to either do combined cataract and epiretinal membrane surgery versus staged surgery. And so um, there's some data that looks at this question. And so this was a randomized study looking at um, patients who had epiretinal membrane and cataract and essentially looked at either combined surgery or staged surgery with either cataract or vitrectomy being the first one and the second one, but being done four to six weeks later and found that the visual acuity and anatomic outcomes as far as macular edema, um, central macular thickness, um, uh, refractive error was all um, comparable between all of the groups. And so similar uh, structural and visual anatomic outcomes. They found that actually the patients who went stage surgery, who had cataract surgery first, were actually 17% of patients who ended up getting cataract surgery and then their visual con complaints were completely resolved and they uh, essentially then um, opted to not undergo uh, vitrectomy. So just again, a, a, a plug potentially for the role of, you know, weighing towards stage surgery being beneficial. Um, this is a study looking also at staged versus combined surgery and finding similarly that visual acuity outcomes at one year between either combined or stage surgery was similar, but that as one might expect, the, uh, the improvement in vision is faster when you do combined surgery versus not. So at the six month, that middle time point, the patients who had combined surgery achieved sort of better vision you know, um, compared to the patients who are still potentially undergoing surgeries to get everything taken care of. And then this was a systematic review meta-analysis looking at, again, the same question of these many different studies that have um, looked at uh, combined, cat combined or sequential cataract surgery, this one looking at oh, either macular hole or epiretinal membranes. And when you um, uh, for the subgroup analysis was so specifically epiretinal membrane patients finding again that in general, the structural and functional outcomes appeared to be relatively similar at the one year time point, as far as things like visual acuity, macular edema development with either staged or combined surgery, and that the, um, the complications were uh, comparable as well. So overall, I just maybe kind of bring this up as far as the pros and there's pros and cons to both. And certainly it uh, also depends on that clinical assessment of both the epiretinal membrane and a cataract of how much they might be playing a role in somebody's visual concerns. Combined surgery is, um, of course, uh, you know, the pros being potentially that it's convenient for the patient and that overall less costly to do one combined surgery compared to two in staged. Uh, the data would suggest that visual recovery is faster and that um, in general, um, that the anatomic and visual outcomes between the two are similar. Stage surgery, of course, has its benefits as well. So there's the logistics and coordination of combining surgery between more than one surgery, uh, more than one surgeon. Um, there's the benefit of being able to optimize the surgical approach for each component. So for example, for doing an epiretinal membrane peel, um, it's potentially ideal to have, you know, cataract surgery done first and then the corneal edema, the 
posterior capsule wrinkling that occurs in the immediate postoperative period has been resolved by then having a good view to do membrane peel surgery. And then as that prior data suggested, you know, there's more certainty potentially that each component is necessary. So knowing that if someone gets cataract surgery and then their visual symptoms are, you know, functionally much better then they might not actually need that second potentially risky component. And then there's the, uh, uh, of course, always the concept of reimbursement and how that plays a role um, with reimbursing um, for a combined surgery versus doing them two, sep two separate surgeries. So that's everything I have. Um, uh, I'm happy to, if anyone has any thoughts or questions or anything.